call the roll. Good morning, it is now 11.04 a.m. calling the roll for the Monday, July 16th Board of Control meeting. Nan Baker. Here. Dale Miller. Here. Trevor McAleer serving as an alternate for Dan Brady. Mike Chambers serving as an alternate for Mike Dever. Armin Budish. Here. Angie Rich serving as an alternate for Dennis Kennedy. Here. And Lenora Lockett. We have a quorum. Thank you. Minutes from July 9th, are there any corrections? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved. Uh, public comment? No public comment at this time. And no tabled items. And no tabled items. Moving on to the first scheduled item, item number BC 2018-446, Department of Public Works, submitting an amendment to an agreement with the City of Berea for sanitary and storm sewer maintenance services located in sewer district number eight for the period July, I'm sorry, for the period June 1st, 2017 through December 31st, 2017 to extend the time period to December 31st, 2018 and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $300,000. Uh, Mike Chambers of Public Works uh, asking for approval of this item. Just a brief history. We've been working with Berea on and off for many years trying to get them on board. Uh, we had an opportunity to help them out last year and it's got our foot in the door and now we're continuing uh, with another extension of that agreement from last year for another $150,000. Hopefully our goal in the near future is we can have a long-term agreement with them going forward. Thank you. <coughs> Questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. McAleer. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, item BC 2018-447, Department of Public Works, submitting an agreement with the City of Cleveland Heights in the amount not to exceed $300,000 for sanitary and storm sewer maintenance services located in sewer district number 17 for the period January 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2018. Uh, Mike Chambers, again, Public Works. Very similar to City of Berea. These are two communities that want to continue uh, using a direct bill process. Uh, we are giving them both proposals on a long-term solution. This particular one with Cleveland Heights, um, they did actually have a legislation approved late last year, but unfortunately, due to some miscommunication, we never got that until recently, and we processed it. Uh, we are going to make sure that doesn't happen again, but this is a positive situation for the county. Thank you. Questions? Councilwoman Baker. What is the reluctancy of going with a long-term solution? Do they feel that it's going to cost them more if there isn't a need and they're paying like a retainer to be on? No, county? with the city of Berea, I mean, it could be a multi-million dollar um, uh, agreement for us. What they have right now is they have their own funding source. Okay. A lot of our other communities don't. Okay. They rely on the general fund. So what they're doing is they're using their existing funding source as is Cleveland Heights to pay us to do work. Uh, I'm trying to share with them, and I've given them proposals that we could actually kind of save them some money if we go via the property tax, mm -hmm. but there's always that appearance of higher property taxes. Um, so we're kind of working through some, mm -hmm. it's a tough call. We have a funding source to pay us. You have a funding source, okay. Could, can they use that funding source for other purposes and save money, you know? Well, the bottom line is, is they're going to utilize us because the equipment that they need is getting older, right. and that's where we're coming in, and that's why with Berea, I, I can go back maybe five, ten years ago, we visited with them a couple of times, um, but they're reaching out to us more and more now, so I really feel positive about Berea. Okay. Cleveland Heights, I think, will continue on the year to year. Year to year, and, and I'm sorry if I didn't quite, I understand Berea, but um, the other city, why is it that they are reluctant because they have also a source that they, they do source? have a funding source. Uh, for example, Shaker Heights is another direct bill community, but they've entered into a multi-year agreement where we just continue to do the same. Um, I'm trying. I tried to get Cleveland Heights to do that, but their law department said they want to encumber one year at a time. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other Shaker Heights has a continuation clause. Cleveland is Heights there an didn't want to go that. To do that? Not really. It's just it, for processing the paperwork. It makes it a lot easier. But I'm trying to get them mm -hmm. to go that route. But is there an incentive for the city to have it continual? Um, or is it year to year is the same as a continual? I, I wonder. I, I think with Cleveland Heights, they want to be able to encumber the money, much like we're trying to do on our, our process uh, up front, 150000 a year. 
whereas with Shaker Heights, they have um, they do have a funding source as well, and I think we're just using that funding source. Okay, good. Well, I, 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 yeah. yeah, good work on this. I know it's hard to get these cities sometimes to see a better way when they're used to doing it one way. Right. So I, I'm thankful that you're out there working on it. Sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. sure. Good. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilwoman Baker. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Item passes. Thank you. Next item. D 2018-448, Department of Development, recommending a payment in the amount of $1,295 to Abington Court Media for rental of exhibit space in connection with the sponsorship of the 2018 Human Resources Star Conference being held on July 25th, 2018. Hi, David Feinerman, Department of Development. This is for a table at the Human Resources Star Conference. Uh, will be among other exhibitors and will be selling the skill-up service to more than 600 HR professionals. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-449, Office of Innovation, submitting an amendment to agreement with Cuyahoga Community College for training, coaching, and administrative services for various Lean Six Sigma projects. And it's for the period October 2nd, 2017 through August 31st, 2018, to extend the time period to December 31st, 2018, to expand the scope of services by adding additional um, adding additional projects effective July 1st, 2018, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $15,300. And they're adding the following projects, improving the timeliness of child support services and payments, A, early child support engagement project, B, child support contract center project, and C, on-time child support collections project. Catherine Tukajic, Office of Innovation, and this amendment is um, part of our contract with Tri-C to provide Lean Six Sigma training. This will be specifically to add additional training from the Office of Child Support to train an additional um, 22 staff members in Lean Six Sigma and complete those three projects as listed. Thank you. Any questions? I do. Councilwoman Baker. So the uh, results since October 2017, do you track how well we're doing given mm -hmm. we have now a history? Yes, so for child support, they did, um, in their previous one, they had trained five yellow belts, and the project that they worked on actually had a savings of $44,304. Um, it was at estimated at that. Um, it was about 2,200 staff hours that were saved based on their project and the, the um, recommendations that they implemented. They have some additional recommendations that, they have, that they're working on, and once we have those implemented, we'll have additional savings from those as well. So you see the results? Yes. Oh, oh, okay, sounds good. Further questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, item BC 2018-450, Office of Medical Examiner, submitting a subagreement with Case Western Reserve University in the amount not to exceed $174,000 for the provision of an epi epidemiologist to assist with the <coughs> evaluation of the heroin-involved drug, drug in investigations protocol, and it's in connection with the Cuyahoga County, Ohio Heroin and Crime Initiative, informing the investigation and prosecution of heroin-related overdose grants program and it's for the period January 1st 2018 through December 31st 2020. Hugh Shannon medical examiner's office uh, this is a uh, grant that we worked with case on uh, with the uh, from NIJ the National Institute of Justice uh, the essence of which is to use data that's now uh, given to law enforcement by the medical examiner's office to inform their uh, investigations, criminal investigations tied to overdoses, and then to assist the prosecutor's office uh, with um, prosecutions of those um, dealers uh, who cause uh, fatalities. And um, what this will allow us to do is to, the data that's now collected, uh, there's no one specifically assigned to do this work, it'll provide uh, an epidemiologist, a public health um, accredited person to pour over the data, to build a database that will allow us to uh, more quickly get this data out um, 
right now it's a very time-consuming manual process. Uh, this is a three-year grant. It will allow um, that work to be done and hopefully to get it as close to near-time data uh, provided uh, as possible. Um, the, uh, obviously, we are not the primary on this. This is a secondary agreement. Um, so we were dependent on case with uh, A, waiting for the notice of award from the federal government, which never happens on time, and then uh, for them to put their contracts together. We actually did have this uh, back in April, uh, but there were pieces missing, and it took time for case to track those down and then resubmit. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I have a question. Councilwoman Baker. Um, when we have a contract from January 1st, 2018, is there an anticipation at that time that that is a realistic date, or do we know going in that that is going to be three months, six months, maybe longer before that contract will actually be initiated? Again, so the um, federal government is notoriously late in providing award notices to their grantees. Uh, that's kind of already factored in. Um, the start date coincides with their grant periods uh, by, you know, by agreement with the feds to get the money. So, so for your planning purposes, you already know that you can count on the federal government of being late and not to prepare for a January 1st Correct. strategy, but to prepare for maybe a July strategy. Correct. Um, and we've been working, obviously, we've been working with CASE since last year in preparation of the grant to get them data and whatnot uh, for the submission. Uh, so we have worked with them all along the way. The, the real, uh, I guess, the, the big piece of this, the why they're awarding us money is for us to hire this data person, this epidemiologist. Obviously, that has not taken place. Right. Uh, we would need this in place before any of that could happen. Just to follow up then to um, hire this person now that you know you have everything in place, how much more time do you think it'll take between now and 2020 to get this person on board? And it should be a matter of months. Months. So the other piece of this is obviously we're already sharing data that there the hiring of the epidemiologist is only one piece of the entire project. Okay. Um, we regularly, again, provide data. We're going back and doing reviews of old data. So there are things, this was a, a phased approach anyway. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the work that we uh, could start without the hiring of this epidemiologist, we have, again, working back and forth with CASE since last year throughout this process. With the approval of today, does that give you then the authority to really uh, move forward quicker than what you were able to do prior to this, given you've got many things now in place? For certain. For certain, yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. McAleer. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, item BC 2018-451, again, Office of Medical Examiner, submitting an amendment to a contract with 3M Cogent, Inc., now known as Jamalto Cogent, Inc., for hardware and software maintenance on the automated fingerprint identification system. And it's for the period July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2019, to expand the scope of services effective June 15th, 2018, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $8,719.27. Hugh Shannon again, Medical Examiner's Office. So the automated fingerprint identification system, uh, the contract that we've had with uh, Cogent uh, has been in place since 2014. Um, there are, this is a regional system when it was first built out uh, in cooperation with the county and the city of Cleveland. It also included a lot of end users in suburban communities and from outside the county. There are a lot of moving parts on this when it, when APHIS became, when the fingerprint unit actually got started at the regional forensic lab in our office, a lot of the pieces were still out in communities. And so we have been continually trying to get an active inventory. Um, there are transfers of equipment. This piece of 
particular piece of equipment was a transfer, which is why it wasn't on our uh, initial inventory list, why, uh, why Cogent didn't recognize that uh, when they went through their maintenance lists, uh, I'm still trying to track down, but it's a relatively small piece. Um, the, uh, we have actually budgeted um, amounts for all of the maintenance of all of the machines, so I'm, I do not believe this is actually going to be an additional amount of money other than what we had already scheduled for the maintenance agreement. Um, it was just not in the uh, initial inventory when we started going through it, and I think our initial count was lower than what we thought we were going to be paying for, for next year. So uh, again, and then uh, another piece of this is we also do recover funds from the city of Cleveland for their portion of maintenance. So it is to some extent a covered expense. We budget for it, but then we recover funds uh, from the city of Cleveland. Thank you. Any questions? Councilwoman Baker. So the 8700 that you're asking for may not be needed? I, I don't believe it's an additional amount above and beyond what we already budgeted for the maintenance of the entire system. I need to track down what inventory lists we were using and what Jamalto was using. But again, the money that will be coming from Cleveland will at least pay for a portion of this, this amount. We, I think it's like $175,000 for the entire system per year, so. Okay. I guess if, if, if um, you think it's gonna be absorbed through what we've already contracted for, why are we here for another 8,700? So, again, my understanding is, is that when they, we did the initial request for the inventory, because this particular unit was not on the inventory, it showed up $8,000 less than what we had budgeted for. Okay. Now that we found the machine in the inventory, I believe this puts us back to the budgeted amount of what we had already scheduled for maintenance. Again, until I find out from Jamalto Cogent, whatever they're calling themselves now, why they didn't have it on their list as well, I, I won't know that answer for certain. But I'm, I feel confident one way or the other we'll be able to absorb the cost. Um, this, the contract ends 2019 of yes. June. Do you feel that you've got a handle on all of the pieces that are now part of this? And when you come back to us, we shouldn't have any. Yes. So over. the process for going forward, the we are approaching the end of life of the system that was purchased. It was about a decade ago now. Um, there will be an RFP process to replace APHIS. Uh, APHIS not only um, allows police departments to do um, fast identification, rapid identifications, say when they're booking somebody at their, at their particular station or identifying somebody, but also the jail, which I, this is all part of it. We took over Cleveland's jail all of the fingerprinting that they would have been doing at the Cleveland jail is now being done by the county. Mm -hmm. So I said, a lot of equipment is transferring hands. It's still all part of that whole system. Um, and, and being able to track it down was something that I had asked them to do prior to the jail uh, move. And apparently this is just one of those things that got missed. So the answer is Yes. I don't believe that there will be a need for the additional dollars. I believe it's already accounted for and can be absorbed with the existing budget. And when the budget comes up again for tw at the end of 2019 for this? So it was, uh, s there is a scheduled step increase for each year of maintenance oh. in the original agreement, so that will not change. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilwoman Baker. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Thank you. you.
Next item, BC 2018-452, Department of Public Safety and Justice Services, recommending an award on requisition 42247 and enter into an agreement with the City of Cleveland, Department of Public Safety, in the amount not to exceed $86,582.82. And it's for the provision of two Cleveland police detectives to provide investigation services for the Cleveland Domestic Violence Project. And it's in connection with the fiscal year 2017, Stop Violence Against Women Act Grant Program, and it's for the period January 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2018. Good morning, Mary Beth Bond from Public Safety. As Andre has already mentioned, this pays for two detectives who are specialized in investigating domestic violence cases. This is actually a sub-recipient agreement with the City of Cleveland as part of the VAWA grant. The VAWA grant performance period started on January 1st, and it's a 12-month grant that, as Hugh has already alluded to with one of his items, we didn't actually receive the official notice of award until February 9th, and at that, we're not able to send out contracts until we get the official notice of award, particularly with VAWA because the dollar amounts that we get vary from what we submit. We sent the contract to the City of Cleveland on February 13th, and we received it back from them on June 15th. Their process took quite a t um, time because they had to go through multiple subcommittee meetings in order to get review on this. There's this grant also requires a 25% match and they needed to make sure that they could actually meet that grant requirement. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councilwoman Baker. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilwoman. Flip a coin. Councilwoman Baker. All right, thank you. Um, so we are, this is only one year. That's correct. We're already past six months of this year. Um, how have we been able, are these detectives already hired? Yeah, they, um, Cleveland has actually been funded for this initiative going back to 2008. So they did not actually lay off the detectives. They've continued to work. Um, if we don't approve this going back to January 1st, what will happen is we'll return the money unspent back to the state. Unfortunately, with the VAWA grants, there is a, a requirement that 25% of it goes to law enforcement and only the city of Cleveland submitted proposals that met that law enforcement requirement. So we don't have the ability to reallocate it to another existing provider. So it'll just go back unspent to the state. We have not paid them anything and we've made it very clear every week when we called them and said, where's the contract? You need to get it in here. We can't guarantee that you're gonna get paid, but I mean, their process took what it took. Mm -hmm. Is the 86,000 going to be then retroactive payments that? Correct. Okay. Yeah, and the money, back. okay. Yes. All right, thank you. Further questions? Councilman Miller. So who pays the 25% match? The city of Cleveland does. Further questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, item passes, thank you. Item BC 2018-453, Department of Public Safety and Justice Services, recommending an award on requisition 42249 and enter into an agreement with the City of Cleveland, again, Department of Public Safety, in the amount not to exceed $36,051.60. And it's for the provision of a sexual assault advocate to assist victims with crisis intervention and referral services in connection with the fiscal year 2017 Stop Violence Against Women Act grant program. And again, it's for the period January 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2018. This is the second of three subrecipient agreements that Cleveland's receiving as part of the VAWA grant. This one specifically pays for a full-time victim advocate from the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center to be assigned to the Cleveland Police Department. Thank and it's you. everything that I just mentioned with the last contract. Any questions? Just Councilwoman Baker. I guess just a follow-up. So again, we're... Um, six months plus in, is there a same 25%? It's the same, same 25%, thing? yes. The 25% that we're meeting on the VAWA obligation is being made up by two contracts, one with the City of Cleveland for the sexual assault and one with the City of Cleveland for, with the detectives. And again, this will be retroactive. This will be retroactive. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Miller? No? Okay. So moved, seconded by Mr. McAleer. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, item passes, thank you. 
Next item, BC 2018-454, Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Reentry, recommending an award on requisition 40430 and enter into a contract with Recovery Resources in the amount not to exceed $169,000 for Recovery Redirection Case Management Services for the jail for the jail diversion program. And it's for the period January 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2018. Good morning, Fred Bollison with the Office of Reentry. Uh, first is a point of clarification. Uh, the services were, it's listed as being um, provided in the Euclid jail. The residents and the inmates in the Euclid jail have been transferred to Bedford. So it's, it's serving the male population in Bedford. Uh, this is a program which provides uh, assessment, training, case management, and follow-up post-release services and linkages to individuals with behavioral health and substance abuse needs. Um, one of the questions I'm sure will arise is, if this is a program that was starting in January, why is the contract now? We apologize and accept full responsibility, but um, I can briefly tell you what the process as we started the process of um, writing the RFP last, meaning in 2017, April. Um, the internal procedures from the, at that time, Director of Health and Human Services were to have an internal review. First, it was submitted there. When it was returned, and we tried to put it in. The um, OPD had changed the, the template and format for writing RFPs, so it had to be rewritten, and it was resubmitted. And we got approval there. We sent it in. The RFP was actually published in September, which still should have been enough time to get this done, and they were... Uh, the proposals were deadline was in October. As we sent it out for internal and external review, in which unfortunately ran into the end of November, where the Office of Reentry was relocated. And during that relocation, there were a number of technical issues, such as access to the computers, uh, email system changing. Um, and no access to on base. We finally had our budget person come down here to try and enter things into the on base system. Um, some of the things were then somehow deleted in the process and or went to the old email addresses. Uh, when we finally got everything in, um, the new requirement that it was put in by the legal department, understandably, was that vendors required cyber insurance to protect against any kind of uh, cyber attack or loss of personal information. That was then negotiated with the vendor in terms of the amount. When it finally was done, they had to obtain that insurance and then it, it had to go through their internal bureaucratic approval process. So we thought that starting in April would have given us sufficient time. Uh, we learned that there's no such thing as sufficient time and we, we accept full responsibility and apologize for it uh, and are taking steps such as all of our RFPs for next year have already been sent out uh, and published and we hope to do that. Now, the one other thing with this program, the in terms of the budget, it, we encumbered funds for three years but the contract was only written for one year because there have been so many changes in the jail program um, that the, the actual kinds of services that have been provided have had to be modified based on the amount of people going through the length of stays. We did not want to, to commit ourselves to a, a contract for those three years. We are now in the process of evaluating what the outcomes have been uh, in Bedford to see whether we do want to continue or how we would want to modify it. The problems were not due to the vendor itself, but rather to the length of stay that, that people have in there. And if they have a 16-week program and people are only staying there for 12 weeks, it's hard to show completion of a 12-week program. So those are things uh, that we want to address before we commit any further county money to this. I'd be happy to answer 
Any other questions? Um, just with the caveat that you have to ask them loudly because my hearing is not very good. Thank you. And are there any questions? Councilwoman Baker. All right. Uh, first question is, um, is this the first time for this program? This is, this is a continuing program that um, it started originally in 2015. So rather than continue to put contract amendments in, we, we sent it out for competitive bidding. Uh, but it is, so it is a new program, but it is a program that was continued on. And one of the reasons uh, that this becomes problematic is that the, the vendor recovery resources had been working without a contract because they did not, and, and we did not want to see the services interrupted. They know that there was a risk that, uh, that it would not be approved. I guess they were willing to take the risk with the, with the expectation that since the um, Border Control has approved these in the past that, um, that it would, but no money has been spent. They have not been paid any money and we're told that they could not get any money until this would be approved. So the 169 for the recovery um, of case management services, this is retroactive money. Right. That would, that would be inclusive from January 1 to December 31 of this year. And when you come back to us uh, for, for a contract that begins in January 2019, do you feel you have all the pieces in place that you will not be delayed? We are, we are doing an evaluation and we will have uh, an amendment in on base system by the middle of August uh, for whatever we want to do. So this will should not happen again. Uh, the issue of cyber insurance has been worked out and uh, yeah, we, we do not want to be in this uh, embarrassing situation again. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-455, Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Reentry, requesting authority to apply for and accept grant funds from the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, Bureau of Justice Assistance, in the amount of a million dollars to identify assets and gaps in their local reentry systems and to develop capacity and partnerships with other justice agencies in connection with the fiscal year 2018 Innovations in Reentry Initiative, reducing recidivism through Systems Improvement Grant Program, and it's for the period October 1st, 2018 through September 30th, 2020. Yes, we are requesting to uh, our application for the Department of Justice Second Chance Act program. Um, the program will expand some of the, or the grant would expand some of the programming that we have now and add additional um, innovative services. The amount requested from the Department of Justice is $1 million, well actually $998,323, I think, if I'm, if I'm correct, but approximately $1 million. One of the requirements is a dollar-for-dollar uh, dollar match, uh, so 100% match of that million with half being a cash match and half being in kind. There was a provision for a waiver of the cash match, which we submitted. Uh, we have applied for this second chance grant uh, for five of the last six years. And each time um, our petition for a waiver of the cash match has been granted. If it is not granted, uh, either they will reject our application or come and ask us to, for the cash match, in which case we would have to come before, we would have to decide whether we even want to come before uh, council for that, but uh, no, no grant will, uh, funds will be accepted uh, <laughs> promising a cash match uh, and with, without approval. The in-kind, uh, services match has been uh, accomplished through 
So things provided by our, the, the partner vendors that we were working with, uh, Case Western Reserve University, um, Community Assessment and Treatment Services, and the work that the staff in the office of Reentry will be doing. So the cash match, uh, the I'm sorry, the in-kind match has, has has already been fulfilled um, over the amount actually that uh, that they require. So, thank you. Are there any questions for the Councilman Miller? Is the size of this grant the same as what it's been in the past, or is it more, or is it less? It is slightly more than it has been in the past, uh, in one sense, and it's slightly less in another sense, because this is now a three-year grant. In the past, it had been two-year grants for 750000 so the dollar amount has increased. But the reason for the increase is they uh, they want a year of planning and two years of services. So in essence, it's, it's pretty much the same dollar amount. This is a different program that we are proposing than we, than we had before. But uh, the, the, the total amount, this is for 36 months with 24 months being actual services provided. So are there going to be programs that are discontinued and new programs that are started? And if so, could you describe that? Well, we currently are not receiving funding under this, this grant. So it's not that programs will now be stopped. Uh, the, the programs that were grant funded uh, either had been uh, terminated and parts of those programs absorbed through other other funding. But uh, what this will do is increase the services provided in our adult tradition model where case managers go into the institutions to try and establish rapport, do assessments, and uh, develop a relationship that to encourage them to continue when they come out to go to the North Star Reentry uh, Resource Center for advice and services and things like that. It will also uh, be providing behavioral health services to those who were um, what we call trauma care, people who either because of their experience in of incarceration or things that may have happened to them before require such services. And the third innovative program that we uh, will be establishing if we receive this grant is in partnership with Case Western Reserve University Law School to establish a second chance re-entry law clinic where third year law students will assist re-entering citizens not with their criminal case but with outside matters that often impact re-entry such as child support, such as getting records sealed, such as any immigration issues, uh, employment and housing discrimination issues, things like that. So it will be a, a new program uh, that way through partnership with Case Law School. What services were provided under this grant when we had it in the past, and how is that different from what we're going to be providing in the future? Okay. Um, the most recent grant that we received, and again, it's when you say it's not actually under the same grant, it's under these are Department of Justice Second Chance Act grants, but their focus is, has, has been different. This is this the focus of this grant is in uh, improving systems uh, to reduce recidivism, and they're asking, especially in that year planning, to bring relevant players to the table, relevant stakeholders, to try to come up with comprehensive methods to address these issues. And with the issues that we are focusing on are employment and housing. So we've already begun, since that would, that's not costing money, to convene those people uh, to sit down and really look on a comprehensive level 
what the issues are, what the, the problems and gaps are, and how we might be able to address this on a, a system-wide level. So that's sort of the, the focus there. The grants in the past have been more service provided where we provided intense uh, case management, behavioral health, and substance abuse uh, services for the highest risk of recidivism individuals coming out of certain prisons. This this uh, this grant, we will expand the number of people serviced and provide services to those in the county jail, because this is not going to be the intense uh, therapeutic services. This is going to be more assessment connections, linkages, and trying to ensure that people will follow up and be comfortable doing that when they are released. Again, the, the goal of all of these is to reduce recidivism, but the focus of this the, of the Second Chance grant this year is on developing systems approaches to, to do so. You said that it's a, a three-year program, one-year planning, two-year services, but the uh, period that's specified is is only for two years from 10-1-2018 to 9 2020 so could you clarify that? That must have been a typographical error because it is a three-year grant starting 18, so it should be to, to 9-30-21. 2021. 2021, okay. Thank you, I did not... Uh, and final question, when we get to 9-30-21, do we think that another round of grant funding will be available, or will it be up to us to find our we own funding? We expect, for, uh, this is the Second Chance grant program has been in place since 2009. Uh, there is no guarantee. We also will be working to uh, look for other funds or other ways of sustaining some of these programs. The, the planning model, which will be developed, will then need to look at ways to actually implement those things. The law clinic, uh, we are going to work with CASE to try to get a continuum of, of, of funds to be able to maintain that past this. So I, the, the way the, the Second Chance grants are generally funded is that this is sort of pilot money that they look that, to, that it will be sustainable through sources other than that grant. I'll just close with a comment, which is that, uh, in my opinion, reentry is really important, uh, but that... Uh, keeping people out of jail that don't really need to be there is even more important. Thank you. And it's a, it's a, it's a huge issue because it encompasses everything because the, without housing, without jobs, without this, there's a greater chance. So it's, and, and that's what we're trying to do with this is get everybody involved to say, okay, this all inter, intersects, how can we how can we improve on this and come up with a, 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 not global, but a comprehensive way of attacking the problem? Thank you. Councilwoman Baker. Just understanding the funding source, is this a 500,000 and a 500,000? Is a 500,000 federal and a 500,000 non-federal? Or is this a million and a million? What is, funding source is 50% federal? Right. So is that 500,000? No, that's one million, one million would be federal. One so million the, federal. Where the, the grant that we'd be accepting would be for a million, and uh, a million in match, 50% of that cash, which we expect to be waived, and 50% in kind. So it would be 500,000 in kind. Did I hear you say you've got the in kind secured? The the in-kind match has been made 
has been met through um, portions of Office of Reentry uh, staff based on the time they'll be working on on this. Um, the Case Western Reserve Law School, which is providing physical space and um, labor in terms of the law students volunteering their time, the uh, North Star Neighborhood Reentry Resource Center, uh, the providing in-kind services, and um, a lot of the services that CATS, Community Assessment and Treatment Services, the services they're providing are Medicaid reimbursable, so that is also counts as in-kind. So we had no trouble uh, meeting that, mostly with outside uh, matches. Any other questions? Mr. McAleer. Fred, when do you expect to hear if the uh, non-federal cash match is going to be waived or not? When do you expect to hear if the cash match has been waived? We don't expect to hear unless we get uh, the cash match. We will know that um, when they make the decisions on the, on the grants. I, mean, I do not know if they... I do not know if their policy is the, if they reject that to reject the grant, uh, but certainly if they come back to us and say, yeah, we want to give you the grant, but we did not accept your waiver, then we've got a problem and we'll have to deal with that. But as I say, based on what has happened, not only from our office, but uh, any other county agencies that have applied for Department of Justice grants with that uh, cash match and a waiver option have been granted the waiver. So I, I'm, optim I'm, I'm very optimistic that, that would happen. Any other questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Item passes. Thank you. Thank you. This item is a two-part item, item number BC 2018-456, Department of Health and Human Services, Community Initiatives Division, Office of Homeless Services. A, submitting an RFP exemption on requisition 42668, which will result in an award recommendation to the Salvation Army in the amount not to exceed $232,453, and it's for supportive services for homeless men in the PASS Transitional Housing Program. And it's for the period July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019. And B, recommending the award in connection with said RP exemption. Uh, good morning. Uh, Ruth Gillette, Office of Homeless Services, presenting a contract with the Salvation Army. Um, the uh, Health and Human Services levy dollars are leveraged with a federal grant of $537,000 which also uh, contributes to the operations and services at the Salvation Army for the PASS program. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-457. Department of Health and Human Services, Community Initiatives Division, Office of Early Childhood, recommending an award on Requisition 42966 and enter into an agreement with Educational Service Center of Cuyahoga County in the amount not to exceed $38,000 for the provision of an early childhood mental health coordinator. And it's for the period July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019. Good morning, Marcos Cortez with the Office of Early Childhood and Invest in Children. This contract is with the Educational Service Center um, for the hiring of a central coordinator for our Early Childhood Mental Health Program. This will allow us to better coordinate referrals from our community partners, service providers, and others. Um, the coordinator will have the ability to triage cases and send them to the appropriate uh, program provider in our system. And this was, will also allow us to better manage our wait list for ECMA services. I would like to note that this is jointly funded by um, the Office of Early Childhood, Division of Children and Family Services, but also the Adams Board, um, the Board of Developmental Disabilities, and the um, Educational Services Center themselves. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councilwoman Baker. 
This is a new position. It is not a new position. It was, uh, we actually started the program in 2013. Um, it became vacant in October of 2017. And what is the, and this is for hiring one person for the position. Can you tell me what the salary total is then? If we're, our contribution is 38,000? Yeah, the salary total is $45,000, um, but uh, that doesn't include the fringes and benefits that, it, that is included. This is an up to amount. Um, we base that um, uh, amount on the highest whatever the person would choose in terms of benefits. Um, so they could refuse benefits, so we weren't sure what they were going to do. So it will be an up to amount. And full time? Full time, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilwoman Baker. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-458, Department of Health and Human Services, Community Initiatives Division, Office of Early Childhood, submitting an amendment to a contract with Pascal Learning, Inc., doing business as Ready Rosie for the purchase of web-based subscription services for customized child development videos. And it's for the period September 1st, 2017 through August 31st, 2018, to extend the time period to August 31st, 2019, to expand the scope of services by adding up to 268 additional classrooms, effective September 1st, 2018, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $20,000. Good morning again, Marcos Cortez, the Office of Early Childhood and Best in Children. This is a contract amendment with Pascal Learning doing business as Ready Rosie. Ready Rosie provides short videos that our teachers in UPK can select and push them out to parents um, via email. They correspond to the weekly lesson plans, um, so it reinforces what they're learning uh, that week. These videos outline and demonstrate age-appropriate cognitive and social development activities that parents can do with their children right in their own home. Thank you. Any questions? Councilwoman Baker. Um, sounds like a great program. Uh, do most that you're trying to reach have the access to be able to view the videos? Do it's my understanding any? that they need to have the, an email and that um, when they sign up for UPK that they, that they have some sort of contact for them. Um, I guess my question is though, are you reaching the people you need to reach given that um, they have the ability to be able to view the video? We actually haven't started sending out the videos yet. Um, there was a change in the model for Ready Rosie, um, so we wanted to wait till that change occurred. Um, and so, and also we expanded from UPK to UPK 2.0, so this is adding all the additional uh, UPK sites. So we actually haven't started sending out those videos. We have done the training for the teachers, but not the actual videos. Okay, follow up. Mm -hmm. So nine one seventeen is when this contract began, but we have not um, invested in this program to date. The like, like I said, the training has occurred. So that part, the training for the teachers, how the, how to actually use the service, how to send out the videos, how to choose the videos, has occurred. Okay. But the actual videos themselves being sent out have not ha has not occurred. The additional twenty thousand. For the 268 additional classrooms, without any um, knowledge of how the prior, uh, how do, how did we come to 268 additional classrooms without any? It, it's it's not 268 additional. It's up to 268. That is the total number of classes for UPK and UPK 2.0. So that's the total amount. That's yes. Okay. Further questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, BC 2018-459, Department of Health and Human Services, Cuyahoga Job and Family Services, on behalf of the Community Initiatives Division, Family and Children First Council, recommending an award on Requisition 40437 and enter into an agreement with the Ohio State University in the amount not to exceed $105,347 for planning, coordinator, and facilitator services for the Youth Advocacy and Leadership Coalition of Cuyahoga County Program. And it's for the period January 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2018. Good morning, Robin Martin, Family and Children First Council. 
Um, this program serves over uh, 250 youth ages 13 through 18. The youth are trained on um, how to provide advocacy across their respective age groups. Um, they also serve as peer trainers and they have um, trained in topics such as opioid prevention and financial literacy. Um, the youth also provide youth voice to the Family and Children First Council members. Um, as you know, the contract is late. Um, we had to go through lengthy contract negotiations and we had some barriers in that process. Um, the major issue was the uh, personal identifiable information and the protective health, health information for the youth that were being served, finding out how Ohio State was going to protect um, their information. Um, the, this is a new RFP. It was released in a timely manner. Um, Ohio State Extension actually received the contract in um, January. December 11th. December 11th, I'm sorry. They, they received it December 11th. However, um, we, it was six months of negotiation re regarding um, the PII and the protected health information. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councilwoman Baker. Have any services been ongoing since the 1st of January? No, services have not been provided. However, there are um, there's a staff and a half related to this contract and the staff were not laid off. So the staff will be paid retroactively? Yes, and they have been planning, but they have not been providing any services to the kids. So once um, the contract is approved, they're ready to go. Um, moving forward, they have an event that has to take place before the end of the year. It's a pretty significant sized event. And um, they're also going to be working on um, voter registration and understanding about voting. Uh, so given that it's not going to start until after today, will the 105000 given that we're retroactively paying a few people, will that be considerably less that you're going to be needing because this contract ends at the end of the year? Probably not because, like I said, they're still going to have um, the, the big event and then there's several smaller events that they have for the youth. So when they have new kids coming in on that 13 to 14 range, they'll have to have money to provide the training for them to get them up and going and into the process. So most of the funds that you ask for in this contract are usually spent on the second half of the year? Typically is spent throughout the year, but they, they understand that because we were in contract negotiations that they're going to have to cram a lot of stuff into that six months. And so that's what they've been planning, how they're going to do that. And they've assured us that they will be able to get that done. Okay. As long as, you know, I guess it would be a little concerning that we're taking a year's worth of services and putting it into six months that the quality of services are given and that we're not trying to spend what is allowed we will to try and finish the contract by the end of the year. We will monitor them very closely, and this is um, part of an RFP process. So actually, in RFP, they're, um, they receive two years with the possibility of a one-year extension. So if we're finding that they are not spending all of the money for this year, then they'll get a lesser amount next year to equal out that amount for the year. Do you think given what you've learned in trying to get this contract between January and December that you're going to be able to next time you come to us have this program started on time? Oh absolutely. So whatever issues you've had you've overcome? Oh yes. Well um, I think one of the things a lesson learned for us is that when there are major contract changes um, like we had this time we'll probably send a letter out to our vendors so that they understand to help expedite the um, contracting process, although legal was very helpful. It, um, they had a turnover in, in um, Columbus of their staff who ordinarily processes their contract, and they just did not understand what we were asking for um, or how to retrieve the information that we needed to verify that they were actually protecting the kids' information. It couldn't go through the local office. The local office worked with, excuse me, worked with us um, but the, the barrier was uh, dealing with all new staff in Columbus. Is this the first time for this program? No, it's not the first time for this program, but it was the first time with that group of staff in Columbus. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second by Mr. McAleer. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Thank you.
Next item, item BC 2018-460, Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Children and Family Services, submitting an amendment to a contract with Youth Law Center for implementation of the Equality Parenting Initiative, and it's for the period August 13, 2015 through August 13, 2018, to extend the time period to August 13, 2019, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $20,000. Good morning, Bob Math with the Department of Health and Human Services on behalf of Division of Children and Family Services. Um, this is an amendment to an existing contract with an organization called Youth Law Center. The Youth Law Center is a nationally recognized nonprofit agency that serves at-risk youth. Um, Cute Quality Parenting Initiative is an approach to strengthen foster care and focusing on excellent parenting for children in the foster care system. Um, uh, youth Law Center has developed these QPI sites throughout the country. Uh, where we share best practices um, on uh, foster care recruitment, providing training materials, and they also do advocacy work and around legislative and regulatory issues that surface affecting, you know, foster children. And I understand there were some questions about the kind of the outcomes over the last couple of years. And I have Jackie McCray from the Deputy Director of DCFS that has pr probably a little more knowledgeable about the kind of day-to-day -day operations of the, of the contract we have with the Youth Law Center. So. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jackie McRae from the Division of Children and Family Services. Uh, Are there any questions? Right. <laughs> I guess we, <laughs> given Thank that you. you're here, it, it certainly is an opportunity to find out uh, what type of results that you've had since the 8-13-2015. Um, we're extending this now for another year, for another 20000 so what can you tell us as to how you've done in this um, program? Okay. Well, the first phase of Quality Parenting Initiative is really about rebranding foster care. And in that process, the first, I would say, 12-plus months was really focused on this three-pronged um, approach to the process, which, one, involved um, defining the expectations of foster parents and caregivers. Um, once that um, definition is obtained, and it's obtained through a process of forms and um, input from um, stakeholders, once that first process is, um, is completed, then it involves actually articulating um, what those expectations are um, for caregivers and what it means to be an excellent uh, parent who provides quality parenting to children in care. And the last piece of that, which is the piece that we are focused on right now, is really addressing those core elements underlying the system to actually realize um, um, that work around parenting. Okay, good. This um, is extended to August 2019. So do you anticipate coming back to renew this program? Maybe that's a question for Bob. Um, and then it would be outlined exactly as you just said. Would it be a repeat of that program? At, at this point, um, that would be the goal. Um, right now, since we're really focused on the system piece of it, we're looking at influencers uh, regarding our placement stability. Um, we're also looking at um, this as an influencer for our recruitment and retention of our foster caregivers and our relative caregivers. So we're in those phases right now of being able to um, quantify um, some of the information around that. Okay, because this is an extension of a previous contract for one year. I guess I'm just asking, would there be another extension or would there be a new contract? Are you finishing this contract? Is that what you're asking? Well, the Youth Law Center is the only entity. They develop the QPI. So if it's something that DCFS feels there's value to maintaining, you know, being part of that network of QPI providers, right. then we'd go ahead and, and enter into a new contract. Well, that's a new contractor amendment. We'd, I mean, they're the only ones. Youth Law Center is the only one that developed this. Okay. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. McAleer. Have you seen a number of increased uh, foster parents come in since this contract is in place with the services they provide? since one of their goals is recruitment? I would say at this point, it's, uh, it's a little early. Um, one thing that we have been told as we embarked upon QPI is that there may be a period where you actually experience a decrease. Um, once you're very clear about expectations, then, you know, 
actually caregivers will have to understand how they carry those out. So um, to make a long story short, at this point with our own agency foster program, we're kind of at a break even point. Um, we've reduced the bleed of homes closing, um, but we are not bringing on as many um, new caregivers as those that are closing. So we're pretty even at this point. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item passes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda items are 461 through 463. Does anybody have any questions? I have one. Councilwoman Baker. Um, just, you know, always going back to the um, public works and the Cleveland Police Headquarters for another, looks like 28.5. Is that coming out of the original budget? And do we know what is left to be drawn down? Good morning, Tom Pavich, Public Works. Uh, yeah, this is part of the original alternate procurements. Okay. I think we did six of them total. This was the last one with FBM. Uh, that was approved, I think, uh, March 12th. It was for uh, up to 200000 This uh, maximizes that 200000 Um we're at, I think, 100, and so if I'm doing my math, 171,005. You know, we're still getting some odd and invoices coming in. We want to make sure we have proper approvals before we do any more purchasing. If we were to surpass 171,000, so these two deals will max it out at that 200,000. Um, I did check with Matt Ryan, you know, he's overseeing this project. I checked with him Friday, and he said, you know, we're still on budget with this project. Um, and a side note, you know, I did tour this facility on Friday, and um, you know, it, they did a phenomenal job. I mean, if you haven't had a chance to get over there, I mean, I would get over there. You know, because I've seen it from the uh, the start, the gut job, and now the finished product, and uh, you know it's a really good project. So, thank you. If I can add real quick, we we had these items on maybe about three or four agendas, and we pulled them because we weren't quite sure. But as it turns out, we needed them, and we just put them back in. So we did strip them out uh, a couple of meetings ago. And this will be the final ask, you believe? For the f <coughs> excuse me. That's related to the original alternate procurements. Right. You know, a few weeks, or maybe a few months ago, we did get approval for um, two separate contracts, I believe, with uh, Lakeside and Mars. We worked with uh, Lenora's team, and okay. we got, I believe, two separate $100,000 contracts approved. Right. Uh, but this maxes out the original alternate procurements dating back to last October. Okay. For the general fund capital projects. Mm -hmm. For the alternate procurements that we got approved, you know, it's not to say we're not going to have other stuff come ahead that would be... But isolated from these, but this actual group, this will maximize it out. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions on the consent agenda? Mr. McAleer. Mr. Chair, can I just ask a question on the still up program? Uh, Dave, if you could just uh, let us know just how many em uh, employees were trained and then what the aver average hourly rate went from X to X with those trainings. Uh, so these are requesting approval to um, enter into a department order for these amounts. We can get you specifics. Uh, Athens Foods is doing two cohorts of uh, refugees who they've hired and they're training. This is an expansion of the uh, county library partnership. So we are helping to develop training plans so that the library can deliver English language uh, literacy skills so that these workers have uh, the capability of reading and interpreting the policy handbook and signing off that they acknowledge it reading their good manufacturing practices and um, being able to communicate during a shift. Uh, for MyoCare and for uh, DMD management, those are for nursing uh, skills and we can get you specifics about how many people are part of the 7,000, 15,000 or $22,000 requests. That would be helpful to just to share with the council members because I think it's a good story to tell and mm -hmm. a lot of people are helped by this program. So. Thank you. Further questions on any of the items? Seeing none, I move to approve consent agenda items 461 through 463. Is there a second? Second, second by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The consent agenda items are approved. Is there any other business? Yes, we have one additional item. It is not a mission critical item. It's a regular additional item being walked on by the Department of Public Safety and Justice Services. Uh, they're requesting approval of an alternate procurement uh, process to issue RFP 43173 for a mass notification system for a, a period of two weeks with no pre-proposal conference. 
and the funding source will be used as general fund. Good morning, and thank you for uh, even considering this. You may recall that um, back in June, I came and talked to you. In January, we were notified by our existing mass notification provider that they were going to discontinue the services. That contract was originally supposed to end on June 10th They did because they're actually getting out of the business. They did agree to extend it to March 10th, and as soon as they notified us, we started developing an RFP. We developed the RFP, we issued it, and it closed back in June. We received seven proposals. One of the components of the RFP is there was a long list, multiple page of technical specs that were required. Some were, requi were the technical specs for the system that we wanted. Some of them were identified as mandated. Some of them were identified as preferred. The ones that were mandated, the vendors who submitted proposals were required to meet all of the mandated requirements in order to be considered, continued to be considered for um, whether or not we were gonna use their system. We found out late last Wednesday, we got confirmation that none of the seven proposals actually met that requirement. Mm -hmm. And so what we're asking to do, what we're planning to do is reject the proposals we have, reissue the RFP. We've actually, over the weekend, went through the RFP and stream, we looked at each of the items that were, we, were, we were requiring and took it down to the bare bones. So we've actually eliminated 20 of them and in a couple cases, and we just left them as preferred items. And then what we've done is that we've kind of made some of the requirements a little bit more broader with the expectation that people will be able to submit. The reason that I'm walking this on today though is that, as I said, our existing contract ends at March 10th. This is a contract that is going to have to go to the county council because we're anticipating it's going to be over a half million dollars because it's going to be a five year contract. And this is a contract that isn't just used by the county. We have 26 communities that use this mass notification systems and 10 other agencies that are out there. So it's also heavily used. We're on a very aggressive timeline and we just really couldn't wait. Thank you. I move to amend today's agenda to consider the item. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The agenda is amended. Any questions on the item? Councilman Miller. Uh, is the current vendor done providing services or, or are we still in the uh, extension? They, they are still delivering the services. They'll deliver them through March 10th. Through what? 2019. 2019, I'm sorry. March 10th of 2019. I'm sorry, thank you. Are we expecting it to take that long to get a new vendor? We're ex we had originally planned that we would have had this contract approved by county council and we'd have been able to start by November 1st. At this point, we are hoping um, to get on the last meeting of the year so that they, they can go ahead and try to get this installed over the holidays and get all of these communities trained um, in January and February. So it's gonna be a long RFP process. When you say it's gonna, I mean RFP processes are long to begin with. I mean this RFP that we just, that closed in June, we started working on in February and we weren't, we were planning on submitting that to you in, uh, mid-September, so I mean RFP processes do take a long time. My, my experience is that things usually take longer than you think, so I'm not gonna give you any pushback on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. McAleer. This is to replace the Ready Notify system? That's correct, that, okay. that is what we're talking about. And will uh, residents and cities have to re-sign up as you know, or is that gonna be one of the mandated services? No, that's that actually one of the mandated services is that the system that we get actually has to be able to migrate the data and all of the user preferences. And just out of the seven proposals, did any of them say they can take the data or was that one of the issues? Um, you know what, I honestly, because I'm handling the procurement, I would not allow them to tell me that detail because I wanted to make sure I was objective as possible. Okay. So I don't know the answer to that question. That, that just you know, could eventually be a problem. No, in reading the proposal, you know, I took and read the narrative portions of the proposals and I didn't get the sense that that was an issue, okay. but I did not, re I specifically did not read that table. That table's being reviewed by the county IT and a member of emergency management. Further questions? Seeing none, I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Item is passed. Thank, Thank you. you. Any public comment? 
No public comment. Uh, move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second by Councilwoman Miller. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>